Alexander, great to see you again. Well, last time I was on the phone, actually, when you were yes, treading the boards yeah. as Madame Morrible in Wicked, yeah. Yeah. Early, early 2020, which I have to say helped sustain me just as an audience member because it was one of the last shows that I got to see on Broadway. Oh, um, good. That very long, long period. So I kept sort of thinking back to it. And uh, yes, and well, exciting to see you in the peripheral. And I love your character in in this so um yeah. well first of all maybe you could just give me a bit of an insight into what sort of drew you to be involved in the peripheral is this a kind of genre that you're usually uh drawn to and kind of into just as a as a viewer yeah strangely i love science fiction i've always loved science fiction i'm a science fiction freak i'm also a horror freak so i love investigative shows i love um uh, I'm also a big Sherlock Holmes fan. So this put all of those things sort of together and the world itself, the books are just phenomenal. I mean, Gibson is a, a genius. And so the fact that the TV show is gonna be made of this extremely complicated, complex world fascinated me. And the way they were able to make this story linear and about family, like whittle it down to, oh, it's basically about chosen and blood family and what matters most. I thought that's extraordinary. The writing is just out of this world. It's absolutely breathtaking. It's just gorgeous. So th that combination drew me to the project. And tell me a little bit about your approach to playing um, Inspector Lobia and um, what she was like to inhabit. Um, okay, listen, <laughs> I am a trained actor, so don't try this at home. Here's the thing, I, I'm really good with, I'm a good mimic, I'm a really good mimic. I, 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 and I have a pretty good ear, but I'm not the greatest at dialects. So the big thing for me, my big worry was the accent was how she sounded. I wanted her to sound a very particular way. Didn't want her to sound like everybody in the show. So I wanted a very particular accent. I'm also a singer, so I have an ear for, you know, I just had a sound in my head, but I didn't know what that was. So I was, this is terrible. So I was watching, well, maybe it's not so terrible. I was watching Mary Poppins and we love the Julie Andrews. And she's got this line where she sees little Michael, you know, the two kids, and she says, Michael's going, and she says to Michael, close your mouth, Michael, we are not a codfish. And I went, that's it, I found her. And so I, I that was the sound I had. Once I had Lobier's sound, that sort of Julie Andrews light upper crust, in between Cockney and, and fall, 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 like that weird thing she's adopted. Once I found Lobier's sound, her intellect, her uh, intelligence, her wit all fell into place. It all made perfect sense to me, strangely. So I, I worked a very different way with Lobier than I did with any other character I've played. Oh, that's amazing. I, I did wonder if maybe you were sort of channeling someone in, in, in some ways, but that's um, that's fascinating. That, yeah. That's how it came to you. Mary and, Poppins, who knew? Yes. <laughs> um, and what about the look? When you, I mean, if, if people aren't following you on Instagram, they all should, because it's one of my favorite, um, you're one of my favorite accounts to, uh, to, to follow. Uh, when you posted a still um, as your character, um, as Inspector Lobia, you, you got a great reaction to it and lots of people were commenting on the look. Obviously, that's what we had to, to go by then. But uh, what do you sort of make of the way that she presents herself to the world? And um, did, did you have some input on the look? Of course, you mentioned Sherlock Holmes uh, at the top there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They had, the designers of the show are truly brilliant. They're so imaginative. And weirdly, when I when I got this, a week before I auditioned for this role, I went to my hair salon. I live in Long Beach, California. I go to a hair salon called Salon Benders, which is here in Long Beach. And it is a very particular kind of hair salon. It's specifically designed for LGBT people and spe even more specifically for trans people. Because when people transition, the way you look, especially your hair, matters the length of it how it's cut going into a public place for the first second or third time as a trans person can also be triggering and this place because it's queer owned trans owned and trans run 
it's a very welcoming, kind, safe space to be fabulous. So anyway, I so Jesse, who owns Salon Benders, we were just futzing with my hair and she said, I'm just going to do something completely different. So she cut it all off, literally shaved it all off, not all of it, but cut it real short and then put this white streak in the front of my head. Like the, you know, the Madeline Kahn thing in Young Frankenstein. I was like, I love it. So I auditioned for the peripheral. I got the role and I turned the producers and I said, listen, I can take all this out and calm myself down. And they were like, no, 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 no. That's one of the things we loved. We love that this can be some kind of signature. And then the hairstylist took this streak and sort of bent it and made it part of who Lobeer was. And from that, they sort of added this Sherlock Holmes look futuristically, gave her a little cane, a top, well, not a top hat, but a little, you know, Sherlock Holmesy hat, a jaunty little feather. <laughs> and so she kind of looks like somebody you recognize that sort of hip. And then she also looks like something from the future that makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. It's fascinating what they did. So I did nothing. I just want to be clear. I sat there like an idiot. This was all the designers. Yes, oh, fabulous. And I, I love how playful she is and yet, you know, very intimidating. And um, I, I love the moment where the, uh, the poor young man sort of comes in to pour some tea for her and his hand is really, 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 really shaking. Yeah. Um, because I guess there's something about playing a very powerful person, obviously in that the room and the scene that I'm talking about, she's, you know, uh, she has all the cards in, in some ways, doesn't she? Um, but I guess there is that uh, idea of uh, letting other people sort of show how powerful she is in some ways rather than, you know, you, you don't really need to do that as a, as a character. Is that well, something? you know, things like that don't work unless uh, the actors around you mm -hmm. are immersed in, in the world as well. And so I would, I would have had to have worked much harder had I not been surrounded by these master actors who you know, you could see their insides shaking when I entered the room. So I didn't have to do, I didn't have to do anything, which was really great for me. Cause what I learned was, cause as you can see, I'm very animated. I, I gesture a lot. And uh, so for low beer, I made a decision because all the actors around me, every time I pass them, they, you know, <laughs> what, what is happening? So I just got to be very, very still and do very, very little. And so everything that I did if they reacted to just made me shift the whole room just by low beer being present. Yes. That was them. And, and when we first meet you, um, well, you're, you're, you're taking your constitutional walk. <laughs> yes. And, uh, we, the we clips get of Dover. At like yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love that shot. That's good. It's almost like a drum roll for your character arriving. It's really incredible, isn't it? I really felt, speaking of Julie Andrews, I really, a couple of times I had to do the spin. I did the spin because how can you not? I'm on the cliffs of Dover. How can you not do the spin? Yeah, it was pretty great. <laughs> and you're there with your robot, uh, Beatrice. So yes. what are the sort of dynamics there? They're almost like a bit of a double act. Um, yeah, we, I got so lucky with this, this shoot because this is not always true, but every single human being involved in this thing was a, just a winner. We got along. So we spent most of our time laughing and acting like idiots. Most of the time, Vincenzo would have to go, can you shut up? We have to do this shot. You, you people calm down. We were having so much fun. And especially the two of us, we, we really, truly, deeply, spiritually enjoyed each other. It was a real joy and there's a great um scene which, which which people will get to see as they watch more episodes with you and uh chloe grace moritz um where you're kind of almost sort of sparring with each other because you you get to ask each other a certain number of, uh, of questions but what, what was uh she like as uh as a scene partner chloe's one of the kindest most generous actors I think I've I've worked with and I don't know how long and not just as an actor but as a human being. She I'll never forget this we we were filming a scene and it was ha it was all day. It was 100 and something, 101 102 degrees. It was in New York. We were in a mausoleum. So it's surrounded by uh brick and mortar. So it was like being in a hot box in the middle of the desert. I'm in all tweed 
she's in full black pleather or le- whatever the heck she was in. They put some cat suit they put that poor woman in. Sweating, schwitzing like crazy all day, filming this scene over and over, which you have to do, you know, over and over and over and over and over again, all day, five hours, six hours, seven hours. Finally, towards the end of the day, one of the writers, I think, or producers came up to Chloe. It was just the two of us and said, listen, um, we're going to add a little speech here. And they gave her like 10 brand new lines she had never heard before. They said, we need you to say this. And she said, okay, text it to me and put it on my phone. So they did. She looked at her phone. This is exactly what happened. Remember, this is the end of the day. End of the day. We've been filming all day. She looked at it. She put it down and said the speech perfectly, word for word, five or six times in a row. And not just spoke it. I mean, was in the center of it, was was with me she we were partners in this thing she didn't exclude me her ability to receive information and to stay present in her joy and her gratefulness is unlike anything i've ever seen before really wow that's amazing to hear isn't it yeah and and since we last spoke alexandra and when, when we were talking before you were working on your memoir and um since oh. then you published it you, so and released it to the world. I, ju- I just wondered what that experience was like of sort of reflecting back over your life and kind of shaping it into a book and then putting it out there into the world. Oh, it was a nightmare. Listen, I kept people, all kinds of wonderful people kept telling me as I was writing this thing, this is going to be so cathartic. This is going to be so, you're going to be so excited. You're going to be so refreshed. And I was writing it weeping shattering going through all kind going reliving my trauma and right like <laughs> thinking when does this when does the when does it happen when is it cathartic when does it happen now weirdly now i understand what they were saying because weirdly the catharsis is happening now now that i'm talking about it because what i realize as i talk about all these things in my life that i have been through as I talk about them, I realize I'm not reliving them. I've survived them. I've learned from them. I now realize that there are people in my lives that are great gifts and great guides because of them. And so now the catharsis makes sense to me. But writing it was, I'll never do that again. I wanted to jump out the window four or five times. But it's later, I think, when you're able to look at it myopically, you know, through a very specific lens that you're able to go, oh, I see where the healing is. And you did the, you did the audio book too, is that right? I did. And the audio book was sort of fun. Uh, Parts of it were difficult uh, reliving, you know, anytime I have to go back to the 1980s and 90s when the AIDS plague happened is always going to be difficult. That's never easy. You know, people are always like, well, that was so long ago. Not to me, it wasn't. Not to me, it wasn't. And I think people now having been through the quarantine and the COVID virus, I think now there's a whole generation of queer people that have survived the AIDS plague that can point to this time and say, do you remember what you felt like when you couldn't leave your house? Multiply that times a hundred and then pretend the government was pretending everything was fine. That's kind of almost what it was like to survive the plague. So when I did the audio book, you know, reading that was difficult, but the rest of it was kind of, was kind of great. It was kind of fun, I have to say. Well, and you mentioned um, earlier on about being a singer and I have to say something that really uplifts me is your version of Let the River Run, which I have on my uh, Apple Music and um, sometimes listen to a few times in a row when I need, when I need to hear that. (laughs) That's lovely. I'm glad. That's one of my favorite songs. My wife actually gave me that song years and years and years ago. And I'd never heard it before. And I was singing somewhere in Chicago. And she said, I heard this song from this movie called Working Girl and you need to. So she's the one that brought that into my life. I lo- I'm glad you like that song. That means a lot. I'm glad. Well, Alexandra Billings, delight to chat to you and congratulations on the peripheral. Thank you, friend. Thank you. Thanks so much. Speak to you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. <laughs>